Hello, welcome to that beat with Eden and Jeff. Um, this episode, we talked to Lauren Dempster and Margaret Kraft. To L U, just actually say the name. To Lawrence University instructors, professors. I forgot exactly what their titles were. Lawrence an instructor. Yes. Lecturer. Lecturer. That's yeah. what it was. Um, and both with master's degrees, um, which we got into talking about right away in the episode. So I really like. Um, I really appreciated Margaret's perspective as we, as we talked about title Mm -hmm. and talked about that idea of, uh, uh, why she doesn't like the word master. So we'll get to hear her kind of elaborate on that a bit. Yeah. And I think Lauren had an important take on it too. Yeah. Uh, And don't take yourself too seriously. And, yeah. and these are accomplished professional performers, um, dance and music, and even to be humble about title and role and poke fun at it a little bit and to understand that there's, there's things more important than a fancy title mm-hmm. uh, or a degree, yeah. um, and even just the mindset that goes along with that. I'm still practicing getting better. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Highly accomplished people, also humble. Um, Margaret is in dance. She taught, she speaks about dance as just movement, right? Everything that we do um, when we're moving our bodies is dance. Um, and Lauren gets into that too, as he um, talks about his early years in sports and recognizing that even that was a type of, of dance. Mm-hmm. Lauren's dad introduced didgeridoo to the States. So that I didn't know before. Right. <laughs> that was awesome. Um, the deep family roots yeah. in music, creativity, design yeah. uh, for Lauren. Mm-hmm. Can you share with us? He talked about, uh, we asked about kind of the COVID influence mm-hmm. in they had recently made a move from New York to Appleton. We talked about that time period. Uh, we talked about COVID and the impact that, they had, that had. Uh, almost switching roles and a transformation within that relationship in terms of work um, and and care for family. We got in deep there uh, around what that looks like. Uh, And Lauren had a quote that I really liked. Uh, What would I do if no one was paying me? Mm-hmm. Right, like mm-hmm. the intentional mindset shift of okay, now I can work on projects that give me energy. Yeah, uh, I talked about those that he uses to heal himself mm-hmm. through his his music um, and his creation there. And I thought um, that was a takeaway: you know, how important that mindset shift was, and to listen to him tell his story about how he uses that. Um, to process and heal feelings and emotion and past experiences. Yeah, yeah. So that the sort of COVID slowdown, forced slowdown, and just even the initial move from New York to Wisconsin, which also allowed him to slow down so that he could process some past um, traumatic experiences. Um, and they talk about the difference, kind of their their take on their perspective on that difference between New York New York City and Appleton, Wisconsin, and um, and particularly that importance of having an environment where 
that was more supportive to family. Because when, because Margaret talks about her experience having a young child in New York City, and at the time, they're not being, I, you know, not seeing children in spaces of art. And so she had actually created these spaces, brought in, um, introduced ways of incorporating children into art spaces because that wasn't there. Yep. So I love that. I, I love how connected, how much they get their daughter connected to the things that they're doing. She's always there. Yeah. Always. Designing it around that. Yeah. Designing, intentionally designing it yeah. around that integration of family and partnership and work. And then the big thing for me, um, one big thing for me that I took away from this episode was the personal is universal and that idea of sharing through music, through dance, your personal story, because everyone can relate to some aspect, right? Like there's emotion and everyone experiences similar emotions um similar themes of similar life event themes uh so just being open to sharing that through their respective art lauren talked a little bit about philosophy of teaching for both accomplished teachers and the energy from that uh, and he talked about you know, letting his students experiment mm. and try it mm. and listen back to it and try it again uh, versus him kind of coming in as the expert and saying, here's what we need to do differently. Yeah. Um, you know, just keep going, keep practicing, find something that you like that you like mm -hmm. and play that. Uh, that was a key takeaway for me too. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that. That, that wraps up, I think, the big takeaways that we've had in this really an, an incredible couple yeah. collaborating yeah. in the arts and supporting each other. Uh, we saw that during the episode. They were supporting each other in conversation yeah. to tell story, building off of each other. Yeah. That, that shined through. Thank you both for being on. Yeah. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Hello, welcome to That's Deep with Eden and Jess. Today we have um, two guests, Lauren Dempster and Margaret Pack. 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 Ah, shoot. <laughs> Margaret Pack, and um, both in the music arts world, both collaborators with each other, both collaborators with others, and You've done solo stuff as well. Um, Lauren, a master of cello. And what is your dance? Do, is it master? Of, is there? Oh, is it like my degree? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I have an MFA. In oh, dance. awesome. Yeah. So two masters here. Um, that I like that word. But graciously yeah. taken the time. I love that word for, um, I, and I really believe that people should own it, but that's just me. Um, you know, so, I don't like the historical master, mm -hmm. master slave, mm -hmm. master, mm -hmm. um, and also even just like master of something. I don't think that um, that's, that's not something I aspire to. Mm -hmm. um, Aspire to I have a deep and broad experience and mm -hmm. and I do have an MFA, which is a master of art, but like you know, but the word uh, itself I like yeah. feel a little yeah uh, yeah or about mm -hmm. well in any case to 
amazing human being that I am thankful that you graciously accepted this um, role of being guests on the show. So thank you both. Thank you for having us. Thanks for asking. (laughs) (laughs) So uh, one of the things that, um, of course, I have some questions for you all. Um, So one of the things that I was interested in is when you, when did you first kind of get introduced or remember being introduced to what you do now, to music, to dance? Um, Was that something that was a part of your upbringing or was it something that was, um, that you found outside of that? You want to go? Yeah, I don't know. You can go. Okay. Well, I think of dance as movement practice. So... I've been moving since I was born. Mm -hmm. Um, So there's that level. And then there's the thing of like, uh, yeah, I took like parks and rec dance with my sister growing up. Mm -hmm. Um, There's a home video of us doing Hawaiian dance actually, where she's like, she's older than me and she like knew every step. And I'm like, and, so, and she's like, oh, she's following me. You know, like, <laughs> my brother's running around us in diapers, you know, just by Um, and that was when I was like two or three, you know. Um, but I was a gymnast because my sister was a gymnast, I was a gymnast mm-hmm. until college. And then my sister, and we had like I was really into gymnastics and we had ballet on the weekends and stuff like that, but it wasn't like ballet for gymnastics. Um, and then when I was in college, my sister told me to take a dance class and I listened to my sister and she's always right. And um took a dance class and I was like, yeah, I do like it. That's that's that version. And then I transferred to UC San Diego. And when I was gonna transfer, I went to a dance show there and I saw Nina Martin's at that time she called it improvography. Mm-hmm. And I was like, that that's what I want to do right there. And that's like more the journey of what I actually feel like what I do now and what okay. I, um so that was what is was that born. what is uh improvog- improvography that's what she was calling it at the time but like a combination of improvising and choreography okay okay yeah yeah so um that's kind of something that you both do and that you're that you both do very well in your respective fields is you're able to hone the um what is i guess scripted Mm -hmm. right structure yeah Yeah. yes yeah Mm -hmm. the structure but then to have the ability to to improvise as well which i find and i think many people find so impressive Mm -hmm. because so many people are kind of only either or in Mm -hmm. that um when it comes to music or dance it's like I can follow along to a to a choreographed piece, but I I can't maybe necessarily get into that improvisation space or Mm -hmm. the same thing with music. Like I can read the notes and follow along to a score, but I can't um, you know kind of go off book. So so maybe talk about like how are you able to do that? Well, I was just gonna jump topic a little bit, but. the lower left, which is a collective I'm a part of, I've been a part of since 2000 officially, but studied with them before that. Um, we talk a lot about the spectrum of improv- improvising to set work. Mm-hmm. And now we talk about it as all choreography. Like it is all choreography. It's just on a time delineation, kind of like how much is preset and or preset, I put set over here, how much is preset and how much is improvised because mm-hmm. dance is always, the dance that I do is always live bodies. And so it's always gonna, there's always some element of improvisation and there's always some set parts too. Like I only have two arms and two legs. There's not much, mm-hmm. you know, like mm-hmm. I probably won't start flying in the middle of it, you know, like that kind <laughs> of stuff. Yeah. It's like, um, so there's always things that are that are decided beforehand and always things that you're deciding in the moment. And so it's just a, somewhere in the spectrum of time. So, but did you want to talk about how you found music? 
Sure. Um, I mean, for me, the you know music goes way back. I mean, I think of my grandparents. They were on my dad's side. They were in choir, and I just recently inherited some antique ukuleles, which is kind of neat. Oh. And uh, on my mom's side, uh, you know, uh, on that Japanese side, I'm half Japanese, half Caucasian. Um, you know, my grandfather's a Buddhist priest, and there's a lot of you know chanting and and this sort of thing. And he had a really beautiful voice, like just this really resonant thing mm-hmm. that would just kind of um, it was just so beautiful to hear in, in a kind of you know church space. Uh, and there was also a piano. So uh, as a part of that, my mom actually learned piano uh, and would play for services. And, and she actually was so good for a while that she was teaching. She had, she had a piano studio in San Francisco in Japantown. And my father uh, eventually turned to, to music as well and, and learned the trombone. So mm-hmm. got to the point where he was the professor of trombone at the University of Washington. Wow. So... I definitely grew up in a music yeah. family, although my mom eventually got an art degree and, you know, went into, into teaching and, you know, it all comes full circle. She actually introduced a jazz curriculum into the Seattle Public Schools uh, for fourth and fifth graders, which was kind of mm-hmm. awesome. I remember getting that CD and just just holding five albums of the history of jazz and like your mom kind of inserted a curriculum like that just felt super awesome. So, and she still improvises and loves to, to play, but just never, you know, did other things professionally. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, I've always loved dance. I think I was an athlete in, in high school. And uh, there was a- Which is dance? There was a fellow uh, team member, Ryan, who was actually a ballet dancer. Mm-hmm. And, a lot of the, frankly, a lot of the other dudes are kind of this just macho aesthetic to sports, as you might imagine, would sort of, you know, make jokes about it. They weren't, you know, they weren't really that clueless. I mean, you know, but still mm-hmm. some teasing going on. Sure. And I was just like, wow, that's a, that's amazing. But it, it seemed like the combination of music and athletics to me, like dance was like using your body for art. And not just for this athletic person purpose. And at that time, I was thinking of music as not dance, which is now that I'm a, have a greater perspective of Margaret. I know that of course this is dance. Moving and playing is is movement. Mm-hmm. It's it's a dance. Maybe it's functional a little bit, but it is movement. And music is like sound is is moving. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, but you know, at that time, I had this kind of. Uh, kind of binary thinking. Um, so I just thought dance was the ideal form. Um, You're right. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I, you know, just was very jealous of, of my my teammate that he was he was you know in dance, but I never really never really pursued it. It was just enough to just to try to play the cello well and hit a hit a baseball, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but I started to work a little bit with dancers in college and and just sort of continued on working mm-hmm. with dancers since then. But yeah, not sure if I answered the questions. But. <laughs> How did you find music? Yeah, yeah I think your, your dad also brought what you do to the United States, didn't he? <laughs> yeah, I mean, he got a Fulbright. Wait, what? They got Australia in the 70s. Wait, what? Yeah. And he's, he hung out with. An Aboriginal tribe whose name I can't remember. I think it was in the Northern Territories um, for like a month or a month and a half or something. And so he learned to redo and then, you know, started teaching people in the States. And of course, now it's this ubiquitous thing, but I think he's one of the one of the first people to kind of spread its technique and, you know, kind of, how to play it in the States. Um, so I, I can play didgeridoo. Yeah. It's kind of a weird skill as a cellist, but it did come in handy once. <laughs> <laughs> what did you do in Carnegie Hall? <laughs> it did. And, and a cock shell. <laughs> yeah, not cello though. So I have a bigger <laughs> career with my didgeridoo skills. <laughs> <laughs> like an ensemble? 
It was something called NC, uh, which is a piece composed by Terry Riley. It's uh, like an anniversary or something of it, right? Yeah. Yeah, so like, I guess this is kind of a funny story, but uh, David Harrington from the Kronos Quartet, because they were, they were putting this on and organized it, called me and said, hey, we want you to be on this you know, performance of NC and Carnegie Hall. I'm like, oh, like, it's amazing. I can't believe someone from Kronos Quartet is calling me. This is insane, you know? And then, you know, we, we wanted to play didgeridoo and shell. And my heart was like, uh, that's awesome. But you, you know, I play cello. <laughs> I sworn, like, I saw you, you know, it's one show where, like, you know, I just like happened to be sharing the stage with them randomly. And he's like, oh, no, no, I know. But for this one, you know, I was like, oh, okay. I just didn't really understand the deal. That was, that was um, right after we got engaged. Yeah. yeah. So yes. okay. talk about how you guys met because I know that you, um, so the cool thing and how I kind of know you guys is that I was in a band with Lauren. Um, we have, I met you guys at 602 Club doing stuff um, and I'll link and post to 602 Club stuff in the, we'll, we'll link it in the, um, in the notes. Um, but we were in a band together and you, oh my gosh, where are they going? Oh, you have, you've taught, you've told the story of how you and Margaret met, but, okay, but can you tell the story again? Is that cool? You tell your version first, I don't hear it. Oh, yeah, there are two different ones? I don't know. <laughs> I'm sure they're not. <laughs> <laughs> well, it changes throughout the years too. Yeah. yeah. No, my, uh, my best friend, uh, I was meeting my roommate at the time, Gabriel Forestieri. Um, you know, we we're in New York and he has this he had a kind of dance company through the moniker Project Limb, I think. Yes, yeah, Project Limb. Yeah. And so he was, you know, always looking for dancers and, uh, you know, had invited Margaret just to kind of talk about maybe joining the company. I didn't really know too many of the details, but, you know, I was like doing dishes or something, trying to like hide the cockroaches or whatever. And then like, <laughs> Margaret walks in and I think we chatted for like five minutes or something while Gabe was, was like 30 seconds probably, but yeah. Okay. Some <laughs> of the time I was like, smart. <laughs> I was like, I just seems cool, you know, but I didn't want to get in the way and, you know, I was exceedingly single in New York, like probably four or five years or so kind of thing. Um, but I was like, okay, I actually should do something about this and try to meet people instead of just, you know, always hustling for gigs and just trying to make a career, do something for my, for a name, make a name for myself, you know, and but I didn't, you know, ask you out for like a year later. <laughs> we didn't see you again for a year. Yeah. But, New York. but she, mm -hmm. you know, Margaret did join the, you know, Gabe's dance, I don't know, company, mm -hmm. for lack of a better word, I suppose. Collective company. Something. something. Collective company, yeah. 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 It's definitely directed by him, but it was, he wanted it to be a collective. Yeah. So. Well, my version, <laughs> I mean, it's the same. It's just slightly different, like from a different angle. Sure, I had just yeah. moved to New York. I'd been in San Diego for 10 years and I moved to New York. And it starts a little further back. I'll tell the long version. Yeah. Um, and first year there, I went to a jam, a contact improvisation jam, which is a form of dance that I do, where you just dance with people. You practice the form of contact, which is partnering improvisation together mm -hmm. um and I had this amazing dance where we were like you know sometimes usually people are either better at being lifted or lifting mm -hmm. and and we were just like one person the other person blah, 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 all through the space like awesome dance and then afterwards he's like I think I know you and I'm like I don't know you because <laughs> you know <laughs> we just dance and um but we're left which is the company and the collective that I've been a part of for a long time I was like yeah and then we figured out where you know we crossed paths before. Um, like you should you should be in my company. Somebody's leaving, and I needed somebody to do this piece. 
So you should come over and watch videos of the of this piece, and I'll show you. You know, and I was, I was like, his girlfriend was there too. I was like, okay, maybe. <laughs> so I went over to the house and or their apartment in Queens, and Lauren was in the kitchen doing dishes or something. And uh, we had like a thirty second, one minute conversation. I was like, hmm. I could tell he was half Japanese or half Asian, and I'm half Asian. Mm. I'm half Korean, he's half Japanese. Um, and I was like, hmm, interesting. And um, and yeah, and then I didn't, and then I joined the company, I didn't see him for a year. He was like touring in Uruguay with Jeremy Wade and like doing all this other stuff that like, but Gabe would talk about him and like be like, oh yeah, Lauren's gonna make music and blah, blah, blah. you know, and I'm like, oh sure. So he was sending videos, I think, to you, right? Yeah, when I was on tour. And uh, then a year yeah. later. We, we were performing and he came to like the, the dress rehearsal or something. I don't even think I played live. I think it was You didn't. Before. You weren't going to play yeah. live. You but played live one day or something like that, but not another day. Yeah. So you came to the dress rehearsal. And we talked, I think we maybe did a subway, you know, together or something like that. And then the next day when you weren't supposed to be there, you were at, like at the, where you come up out of the subway station <laughs> to go to the thing. And he was on the phone and I was like, oh, it's interesting. He's there and like, and he was talking and he like hung up the phone and, we, and he walked me to the venue, even though he was going somewhere else. And he was telling me about a date he was just on and I was like oh he's telling me he's single you know like that he's dating um oh sure that's what I thought at that time but like I didn't know <laughs> he's totally not that suave at all like he was just kind of walking out and seeing him like, and literally just <laughs> did this date because I was trying you know like I mentioned I was trying to make an effort finally and it, you know it was it was it was great but it wasn't well, it was like 4 30 and the date was done so i was like okay yeah yeah, yeah. That, you know, like, it wasn't bad but... single, like... <laughs> well, first, um, amazing if you're watching this you're amazing <laughs> <laughs> I yeah right <laughs> but at the end of the walk he like asked me for my information and i gave him my card which that was probably the only person i've ever given my card to um and then I walked in and we were warming up with the dancers and Gabe was like, I think Lauren likes you. And I was like, I know, he just asked for that information. <laughs> yeah, it was weird because the date had ended like two or three blocks from the show that I said I couldn't be at or something. I don't know. I, I well, can't you were really going, going off to somewhere else. I think I had, must have had some other gig. Yeah, you had a different gig. If I had to just leave. Yeah, we were using the CD that night. But, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. weird so that's what happened. That's how we met. Yeah. So if I hadn't gone on that date, because of yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just gotta lean into that. But it happened. <laughs> and then God married us later. So yeah, he was our efficient. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. yeah, I could keep the clean clip. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Were there cockroaches in the apartment? Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, every apartment. Yeah. In New York City, I don't know but... if this is appropriate for a podcast, like. <laughs> There's no um everything's appropriate. I have outside of um the Robin. Yeah, well <laughs> I can handle that. Um, line somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> no, but everyone has their I know I'm a New Yorker. When you move to New York, you're kind of like don't know what's happening, don't know what's going on. But there was a moment when I knew I was like a serious New Yorker. Because I was in line at Grand Central to get pizza. I don't, yeah, I won't insult it. Pizza place, but it was like my favorite pizza place in New York, like really good. And the line was like 14 deep. And then we're all trying to, like, you know, it's New York, so everyone's like, like the trying to look at the pizza. Mm -hmm. And then on the inside glass, the pizza side of this glass, this cockroach just kind of like crawls, wiggle, wiggle, and kind of crawls. <laughs> crawls. And then, like, it just a slow dance across. I guess we're talking about that. <laughs> and then the 12 people in front of me just like went, just got disgusted and left. And they had like suits. There was clearly, you know, lots of corporations around that area, you know, and they're probably going, it's a commuter rail. So they're going to Connecticut or, you know, like mm -hmm. the suburbs. And then it was just these two other people. And I'm like, have my cello and there's some other person. 
we just kind of look at each other. I was like, and she, she literally says, what do you think? <laughs> I'm like, I really can't say anything. I have live in my apartment and I really love pizza. <laughs> She's like, yeah, I don't have now, but I grew up with them. So we just like walked up and just got the pizza. You had to do it together. You had to have some sort of you Yeah, you have to make a decision. And we're just like, we can't really criticize them. Yeah. Because like, I'm gonna, you know, we all You're both had experience. In Central in the basement, like this, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. So that's when I knew, okay, I, I'm I'm living in New York, I, and I'm fine with it. <laughs> so. Nice. Quite a tangent. <laughs> so you both were in New York. Mm -hmm. What brought you here? I know this wasn't on this wasn't on the on the official sheet, but mm, the conversation. <laughs> I'll just keep doing the long stories. Mm -hmm. Um so we were in New York. We met. Basically we got married. We had a baby. Um all pretty quickly, actually. I was in grad school. I yeah, I was in, I started grad school and it was a three summer program. And the first summer we got married, and the second summer I was pregnant, and the third summer oh. I had an eight month old. Um, and so we had a baby in New York City, and suddenly I was shut off from a lot of what was amazing for me in New York City like the community, the dance community, the being able to go see things all, all, like that was. Mm -hmm. It was really isolating to be in New York City with an infant. Um, and he was working all the time because we were trying to survive as two artists, a baby in New York City. Yeah. Um, and I was like, this isn't working. And at some point, Lauren told me, he's like, you're going to have to be the one to move us because he was too much in the hamster wheel to like think about looking for another job. He was working. At, he, Worked at the Waldorf School a lot on Long Island, a lot of the time teaching cello. He worked at the Westchester Conservatory. He taught, um, taught, you know, private students. Yeah, Lisa um, Bolse. Yeah. John Lagoon was on the side. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Something <laughs> like that, you know. I find the long school you're on that. You did too. I don't think I did. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, would play wedding gigs on the weekend with them, you know, like things like that and also was making music for dance when he'd come home he'd be like composing something um so he was busy and I just got my MFA and I was I had been I've been adjuncting in New York along with teaching in a studio and also still choreographing you know doing all the things so I started looking for jobs and his dad had a residency at Florence, oh. and because he was, um, he was at UW was Brian Pirtle, who's the dean of the conservatory at Lawrence. Was Brian Pirtle was his mentee, like his dad and Brian Pirtle had a strong relationship. So he was here, and Brian was like super excited. He's like, I got, I have a position for dance now, and. And Stuart was like, no, my daughter-in-law is an answer. So, so they looked up my website and Brian Pearl called me and told me about the job and talked to me for like two hours on the phone, told me about the Montessori school here, told me about Appleton, told me, like, told me about things. That's awesome. And I looked at the job description later and I was like, oh, they want me. Like, it really did feel like my experience and my life was like, universe was like here it was like the 11th or 12th job I applied to mm. and usually it was like you know teach jazz and modern and all levels of ballet and mm. and African diaspora and theory and you know and I'd be like yeah sure I can squeeze myself into that position you know um but this was the first job that I applied to that I was like oh you know this, mm. they want me yeah um and they did. Like I went through all the process, you know, like the first interview, the second interview. Um, my friend who also applied to the job here called me, or texted me and said she had a dream that we met in the Midwest and we were having a party. I didn't know she applied to the same job, but like she had a dream that, that I was here. 
um, and later I forgot again. We have a thing, but um, yeah. So there was it was just kind of meant to be, and I got the job. I came here on my forty first birthday for the interview, like the you know when you narrow it down to three people I interview. And yeah, it was just there's there's so much that lined up. It was like this is this is where you need to be. And Lauren moved here without ever having been in Wisconsin, actually. <laughs> you recognized that there was a need to, to change lifestyle? Basically, yeah. But but knew that it was would take her to find something else because you were going. Yeah, I could really home. see past what I had to take care of in front of me. Yep. Yeah. Which is very a very New York mentality. You just get in the grind and then I mean, the thing is, I would leave at, you know, 6.30 or 7 in the morning and be back at 11. And so Margaret was quite isolated. And again, talking about not really being able to be around the dance community as much with a, with a kid. And, you know, I think there's some steps that, that are being taken to kind of help, you know, parents who are trying to stay within the community a little more these days, it seems like there's some of these efforts, but yeah, I'm a boyfriend of that. Yeah, was mm -hmm. stuff and other stuff was starting at that time, but and there are more people there now in the dance community with kids, but it was rare. Like a, a generation mm -hmm. above me, Shelly had kids, and she was like, There was nobody else, mm -hmm. that had kids. you know, like mm -hmm. people would usually have kids and stop dancing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's not like I was working every last hour I was away, but th there would be like, if I'm already out and I don't have a car and oh. I have my cello. You had like a two hour commute. I'd have like a two hour commute to get from one, two and a half hour actually from one school to the other on Tuesdays. I don't know, it's just like. Oh, you remember what day is? So? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And because I, I would get all this work done, you know, I would actually compose pieces on the train. Like, I don't know, I got, I got a lot done just, and I was in the world. So I was pretty happy there, to be honest, but I could recognize that that you were, you needed to change. So I was just kind of, I just. I think you were really happy there artistically, but not necessarily. Our, our family wasn't going to survive there. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. The, you know, I just kind of just trusted that this is what had to happen. And so that's what we did. Yeah. Yeah. No. Are there things you miss about New York? For sure. Yeah. Yeah. The community, the, the people to dance with, like dance is a social yeah. form. And I have some people here that are like, you know, coming. And then there's also like, there, there are students, but students that don't know, you know, like I'm, I'm opening up different worlds that they've never been a part of before and so I really miss the um having people to jump on yeah. basically yeah. um and and that community that's my biggest that's the biggest thing I miss mm -hmm. yeah I feel like that's really it, it, there's there's areas with there's there's certain things in Wisconsin that I feel like are so like we're a little behind on and I think that's one of them like people people feel weird about dance even even dance clubs mm. don't really last because people don't really dance <laughs> and it's, like I remember when um Park Central was downtown and I would go out just for like half an hour early before, so this was a dance club that was downtown. I don't know how long you guys have been here. If you guys didn't know what that was, 2015. Okay, yeah, and I don't think they were. They might not have even been a thing. But this was a a club that for a while they had like different areas that had different genres of music that you could go and dance in. And I remember I would go early. If I went out with friends, they always wanted to go at like 10 or 11 at night. And I'm like, it's a stupid hour to go at. And I was like. I want to go early so that I can actually have room to move my body on the dance floor because nobody's there at eight o'clock at eight o'clock at night when they first open. Like nobody is there except for me 
and I got a bottle of water and I would dance for like half an hour. It would be like my exercise and then I would leave because I love dance, but it's so hard to just like, people just don't dance here. So I really, really am, am grateful for the space that you've kind of opened up and then have opened that up to the public to kind of come in and experience that um, that kind of getting out of your comfort zone and getting into your body and then just a different way of connecting with people without it being and it it's not it's not weird yeah you know it doesn't yeah you saying that actually makes me think about a difference that that I actually missed that I didn't articulate but of being in your body like mm -hmm. the reality of New York insists that you inhabit your body in a different way because mm -hmm. you have to walk, you have to take the subway, you're, you know, you're sitting next to people like super squished mm -hmm. or standing, you know, and like knocking into them with your stuff. Um, you're walking everywhere, you walk upstairs to go anywhere, you know, like there's, there's so much more where you have to be physical and you have mm -hmm. to be in your body. Yeah. And here, it's been amazing as a family and as, you know, as a mom, especially to like have a car and like get in the car and go grocery shopping mm -hmm. rather than pack it all onto my body and the stroller, like pack her onto my body and food on the stroller mm -hmm. and then take it up the stairs and then put it on the escalator and then, you know, take it down where they don't have an escalator or an elevator and like, and then it falls everywhere and then people help you. And like, you know, like there's yeah. such a different, interaction both with your body and with other bodies mm. in New York that it's like lovely to some to sometimes not have that here but mm. also also awful mm. and I also mm. feel way less embodied here in general um mm. I rode my bike last term to and from campus every day and that was really helpful to me but I'm but I'm and it's colder and it's you know like there's all kinds of things that keep you wanting to be by a fire and, and not off the couch here you know mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah 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 I like Whitman's though you can get to New York <laughs> I feel like you're bumping in the sea of humanity go to Whitman's <laughs> <laughs> what do you like about women? Oh, it's just, I mean, just <laughs> that's where he felt most at home when we first yeah, got here. Yeah, yeah. So feels like, like, this, this feels most like, yeah, yeah, people, you know, friendlier because, you know, it's Wisconsin and all that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's still just like a lot of people in one place, big lines, um, kind of a sense of a chaotic organizational scheme of where things are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, like I actually like that, you know, right? Yeah. yeah. It, it takes a while to, or, or, yeah, if you've been in a place. You like while, navigating yeah. through the woodlands, right? Yeah. 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 Like, yeah. And I was always so pushing, cool. like, my cellos on a cart gear, like, amp, you know, going up, like, okay, this, I'm familiar with this feeling. You know? Pushing a cart through. <laughs> yeah. Your spaces. Um, People are a little bit grumpier there. That's what you used to say. Like that's why you liked it. <laughs> People are too nice. I would, I would imagine that's a transition for sure from New York to, to the times. I mean, New Yorkers are are more kind than you would expect, but they're just not surface nice. Or there's not the surface mm -hmm. nice, but there's the like nice of like they'll actually help you with the stroller. And yeah, like someone like, who will you know, actually like, carry your groceries up three flights. And they're total strangers. Those kind of things, like the real, like the deeper level of kindness, I feel like happened more often in New York. Yeah. Even if they were like grumpy at first, like if they're like, I don't know, but then they're like, oh no, it's over there. You know, like yeah. the, there's like not as much like surface level kindness, but there's a really deep. Um, yeah, because everyone, everyone has such a good life. Like we're all in this together. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I mean, it's also post 9 11 too. So. I think a lot of that yeah. reputation mm -hmm. in New York, it's still true. There's a certain degree of yeah. frank communication there, but yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I miss that I just miss like bumping into people that you both know and don't know randomly that like 
the magic moment, spontaneous improvisations that happen because of because you're pushed up against difference all the time. Mm. Sometimes mm. that mm. you have to yeah. be more intentional about creating spaces where that can happen here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. So let's talk about um, projects. Um, so over the last couple of, well, what, was it 2020 that you wrote Circle? Uh, or were I, they I, kind of always, were those always yeah. kind of in process? It was, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Target. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I had, you know, I've been writing, I wrote, started songwriting a little more seriously when I got here. I think part of the deal of, of coming here was that instead of me doing the 8 to 11, 8 a.m. to 11 p.m. thing that I was in New York, I wouldn't have, you know. We switched roles. Yeah, you, you would work and yeah. I would just kind of, you know. Be an artist and all that. <laughs> but what I found is, of course, this was extremely like nerve wracking not to have my day schedule. And, you know, it just felt I, I, I kind of feel like people who retire kind of go through this, although I wasn't retiring, but just like, what do I do with my time? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. one thing that kind of sprouted was just writing songs a lot more seriously. Like, I would write them once in a while, or for certain occasions, I, you know, would compose music, but because I had the time, I ended up just writing a lot of songs. And and the other thing about New York is I only did things that they paid. And so I was just kind of curious, what would I make if no one was paying me? Like, mm -hmm. if it was just up to me to make whatever I wanted, what would happen? Like, I actually had no idea because I just hadn't really done it. Um, that's a neat experiment. Yeah. I mean, that's, that, that's an intentional mindset that you use. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it was, you know... Thanks to Margaret. And so Thanks I feel like <laughs> saying that we wouldn't move without you know, like it's all and yeah. So yeah, I wrote a bunch of songs. I performed at you mentioned the 602 Club after a year. And I wrote some songs. Uh what would that I guess it would have been? I might have performed in 2016 or something like that. And I was just, you know, continuing to do that. And then um in 2020, you know, of course, the pandemic's happening, and I'm we're everyone's stuck at home. I was doing FOM, the February album writing month, which you've yeah. also done. That's F A F A W M, which I, even though I'm doing so many things, I'm thinking about doing it again this this year. I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna do it again this year, and we'll the, the goal is to write 14 songs in the month of February. On this website, and yeah. everyone kind of runs this marathon together, and everyone's supporting each other online. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful environment. So I had done that, you know, the February before March 2020, um, and so I had all these songs that were actually re I really liked. Mm -hmm. So there was kind of six oldies from the previous, you know, three or two or three years or whatever, and then there was like six that I made. And then because we we're just stuck in our house during the pandemic, I just recorded an album at home. Mm -hmm. And so I don't remember when I made Circle, actually. The song or the album? The song. The, oh. the album, I actually recorded it in, you know, that, that summer of 2020. But I, I, I would have to I would have to go back on my computer and actually. Yeah, it was, I, of yeah, I was more talking about the, the album itself. Yeah, yeah. I was listening to it the other day and um, you know what? I think I ended up buying it twice. <laughs> <laughs> because I think I already had it. Yeah. <laughs> I already like I already purchased it. And then um, when I was preparing for this episode, I went back on Bandcamp and I was like. I might have already, I might already have this, but I can't find it, so I'm just gonna buy it again. Yeah. <laughs> so, and I listened to it, and I'm like, ah, oh, this is so good. It's like such a nice, it's such a, it's such a, um, it's sweet, it's comp, it's complex, but it's like subtly complex, and it's just about. 
day to you know day to day life and it's it's so nice to just listen to and just feel like it, I feel like it's like Sunday morning music mm -hmm. almost like just put it on have some coffee or tea and like chill and hang out at a fireplace and <laughs> sure. enjoy listening to mm -hmm. someone just enjoying their life mm -hmm. do you feel like you guys got to even though we were all in to some degree socially isolated and um or physically isolated and um uh, during you know the, the brunt of covid stuff do you feel like you kind of got to connect a little bit more family-wise, you got to like reflect a little bit more on your day-to-day -day life and what that looks like? I will say, because you're looking at me all the time, um, that I actually think just being in Wisconsin compared to New York was the first thing that kind of settled mm -hmm. us into that. Mm -hmm. When we first got here, um, I was teaching Tuesday, Thursdays. He was teaching at Renaissance just in the afternoons a few days a week, but did not work on Fridays. And Eleanor was in pre-K, so she was going to pre-K in the afternoons at the same time he was at Renaissance, Monday through Thursday. So we had three-day weekends together, suddenly, after, after him working from 8 to 11 almost every day, yeah. and her being an infant, and like, yeah, New York, we moved here to a four-bedroom house. We were living in a one-bedroom one apartment in Queens in New York with, you know, like seven cellos or whatever. <laughs> and we moved to a four-bedroom, quarter-acre backyard house with three-day weekends together as a family. Mm -hmm. So it was a huge shift that I think really, like, shifted our family um, a lot. And then... And then we were really privileged in that we both had jobs during the pandemic. So we both and could do our jobs on Zoom. I was yeah, teaching dance so on Zoom. My friends yeah. in yeah. New York it was like, oh, it was a blessing. We weren't there. I mean, they had such a hard time. I can mm -hmm. try to imagine so, it. Gigger, you know, people who are gigging musicians. Yeah. yeah it's rough. And we were here. And honestly, I was like, this is cake compared to having an infant in New York. <laughs> like it really did it was like she was you know what like eight or something when the pandemic really hit mm -hmm. and so like she was you know verbal and like could be online computer and could sit and read for hours which Eleanor loves to read um we could go grocery shopping still even if we were washing our groceries we still could go grocery shopping with a car you know like we could mm -hmm. go outside like yeah it kind of felt like <laughs> to me yeah anyway. as as pandemic experiences go it was it wasn't that bad you know i mean yeah. we all we all made the best of it i suppose yeah yeah and i do think it was i don't know i don't know for you but because it the question is about your album but well, well it's well i mean that question in particular is really for both of you yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I did write, of course, everyone, every songwriter wrote pandemic songs, and I'm no exception. Um, and there's a second album, like I kind of mentioned, I don't know if I mentioned it on air, as it were, but, um, you know, I'm kind of working on the second album, and a lot of those are from the 20, after the first album, there's a lot, these other songs that have come about, and a lot of them are kind of just related to the pandemic. Um, one of the more fun ones is just called Games, where about my daughter and I playing like the games of my childhood on the for free on the AARP website. <laughs> so I'm like, somehow it's like the pandemic. And so I found Centipede and some weird, janky form of Galaga. I'm like Eleanor, look, I used to play these when I was a kid. And she's like, oh, really? So we we're like playing video games and like, and then you know, I think there was some video game chord changes that I liked, and I just like started darking around and just playing with it. And then I started singing, and I was like, oh, this is cool. So I started recording it, and it was just like one of those, you know, I I think 
you talk about the simple daily life things. This is another example of celebrating um, a moment with your daughter playing video games mm -hmm. at the kitchen table. You know, that's how you're getting through this this kind of disaster we feel like is upon us. Um, yeah. Like centipedes. <laughs> but you wrote you wrote a song. Yeah, yeah. yeah you wrote a song. Yeah. yeah. So there's rough drafts on on SoundCloud right now, um, which I haven't released it yet. I'm still like mm -hmm. tinkering, I'm yeah. still in tinkering phase. I think the second album is a little bit more introspective too. Like it's a little bit more, and maybe that's part part COVID influence. Yeah, like getting the chance to process some things. Some things are like, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. Mm -hmm. What is the tinkering phase? How long does that last? So well, it lasts a long time. It depends, right? Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. I mean, like, you know, I'm always experimenting with things, but it's pretty close. I just I might re-record some vocal tracks because as a cellist, my vocals are as many. It's hard for me to be happy with my voice. Mm -hmm. um, although it's, these songs have to be me singing them. I, I definitely am in a happy place if I can write something that someone else will sing, like who's a proper singer, like Jess, you know. But for I like least, your voice. Yeah, I mean it's it's yeah. fine. It's it's good. It's you know. <laughs> but but the cello, like it'll you know, I'll do two or three takes and it'll be fine. And then the voice, thirty takes later, I'm still like, oh geez, you know, mm -hmm. it's just a bit more of a struggle. And then also because I, you know, broken my arm and a rib, and I was kind of using it as an excuse to heal myself was to make this album over the mm -hmm. summer. So the voice just wasn't there. Like I couldn't actually get notes uh, supported, and that, and then I was able to at the end of the summer. And then school started. I was like, ah. So I kind of I might re-record some vocals or that kind of thing. But I just need a, a chunk of time where I don't have to to work. And since I record at home, like the house has to be quiet. And it's kind of hard. Yeah. Go away for four days. <laughs> it's fascinating to me how musicians make music and the tinkering phase and what's good enough to re be released and what that sounds like. So yeah. For describing some of that. That's why I was asking yeah. about. Yeah. I mean, and yeah. what's interesting is I'm making this phase public. So I have all my rough drafts on SoundCloud. So anyone can listen to them. Mm -hmm. And I just, somewhere on the playlist, I say, these are rough drafts, you know. Because they're good enough to like, share with people mm -hmm. but do i want to ask money for this i don't know i just want to feel like i'm just i hooked on to you said earlier you were using it to heal yourself and i actually feel like mm -hmm. a lot of the songs on the second album you're healing yourself with mm -hmm. yeah just i mean like see people and I don't know. The neighbors are dead, and a lot of the other these, these are the titles of songs that. Well, I remember, I remember the neighbors, yeah, I remember the neighbors are dead. I, I, it's like I shouldn't smile about it because that's a real like thing that happened, but it was. It's also like, yeah, it's but that's I think crazy. These songs, are like, a lot of them on this second album are things you're going, you're going deep. That's mm -hmm. the name of the title, but mm -hmm. like <laughs> you went deep and like. Mm. are processing and healing things that you haven't or that you're doing it again because I think we keep healing right but well yeah so like the see people song um you know still in process and all that but as far as the recording but the song's done and it's processing me getting beaten as an eighth grader in uh, Seattle Public Schools to the point where I, you know, went to the emergency room and all that, and You're unconscious. I was unconscious. Okay. And four kids went to juvie. It was in the news. I was interviewed by a different camera, um, and so yeah, I had my had 15 minutes of fame, and I had never really processed that, yeah. you know, or uh, you know, things happen, and you just sort of. You know, slowly but surely, I stopped looking on my shoulder. Although I, I think I still look on my shoulder. <laughs> um, and then, so my brother, he's a poet, and he, he's he has a few books published on uh, Foray Books. Go Brian Dempster and Foray Books. Another, you know, Whitman's or the yeah, poetry. I mean, it's both. It's both. And and that's deep. so many things we got advertised tonight. But um, mm -hmm. but he, he, you know, he he. 
similar to me, I, I maybe for whatever reason, uh, we'll talk, you know, in our art family comes up a lot. And so he was going to use this story from his perspective of how I got beaten and, you know, in some of his poetry. And I just thought, you know, I, I've always felt kind of weird about it. So I just use it as an exploration of that experience. And it's basically me writing a verse from the different perspectives of different people from that time. I think I wrote 10 verses. I was like, okay, this is like a really, really ridiculously long song. So I went it up down to five. Mm -hmm. um, just kind of thinking about that. Um, so yeah, anyways, I think that was a healing thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is, I guess it's, it's just what, what's happening, you know? Yeah, and I, yeah. I, uh, I do think that both being in Wisconsin and COVID kind of provided the space for you to process some things that mm. you hadn't. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think sometimes we can get so, um, so busy doing things that we don't really allow ourselves space to um, kind of work out what what's really going on with us. And I'm always, I myself, I'm always kind of like towing that balance of, okay, am I am I healing or am I just using some of this stuff to distract mm -hmm. from thinking about this, that, or the other thing? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's, it, and I think music and dance are such a beautiful way to express emotion. Um, and I guess we kind of already talked about that. If you guys, if you have any, I mean, do you want to talk about dance and emotional expression? I, because I, I feel like I, I, I feel like there's, there's people that, um, you know, they use art to either um, sometimes to make a statement about something, right? There's a lot of like political art or um, political music. I think of like punk rock theme, that kind of thing. Um, I've always used both dance and music as a way to like just kind of get something off my chest. Um, whether it's something that I've performed or something that I'm just like at home, just like, okay, I can't, like, I don't have the, the, um, like, I don't want to journal. I don't want to go for a walk. Mm -hmm. I'm going like, to sit at my, at my keys and like belt out mm -hmm. what I'm feeling. So mm -hmm. maybe you guys can speak to that a little bit. So many thoughts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, first, what was I first thinking? Too many. I got the clogged. You got some on top? Sure. I mean, oh. well, I mean, songwriting for me, there's a oh, the age old cliche of the personal is universal. So, mm -hmm. so if I share something that's I'm going through, likely, you know, there's other people who are going through similar things, or yeah. you write your songs, just and even though it's maybe not the exact same experience, there's always going to be, and you might think, oh, I'm just writing about my thing or whatever, but it, it really what's happening is is there's real, I think, deep communication between audiences and songwriters, and mm -hmm. it's not necessarily this like. I don't know, egotistical thing on the songwriter's part or whatever to just express yourself. Like there's something actually very, I believe, beautiful about that intimate sharing. And then the people in the audience just will usually connect because, every, you know, most of these things are universal. So mm -hmm. that reminds me, one of the things I was going to say is uh, one of my, are you done? Oh, yeah. Okay. I mean, one of my, um, Mentors Shelly Center, who's an Alexander Technique practitioner, but also a dancer, a dancer with Trisha Brown company and all kinds of things. But um, she, and now I don't know if these are the exact ones, but she has like five that she says dance is. Dance is always autobiographical because mm. it's your yourself. Mm. 
it's always improvisational because it's live. It's always choreographic because everything is predetermined. It's always political because everything's political. Because even if it's not like a, yeah, um, you know, statement about something in the in politics now, like the daily is political, right? Like, what is worth mm -hmm. value? What is valued is a mm -hmm. political statement. Mm -hmm. um, and it's always something else. I forget. <laughs> Google search. No, she's just not, it's not out there, but she's yeah. autobiographical, autobiographical, political, choreographic. It's always something else, too. Not that Shelly. You'll just have to think about it and comment on it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah maybe somebody out there has, <laughs> has something that they think that is yeah, that all. Been, been, sorry, and then now, now the flats are together. Yeah. Um, but, um, and also made me think about what you were talking about the daily life and the and one of the questions was something about what inspires you and one of the things that inspires me um, is growth in general like growth anywhere but uh, specifically one thing that inspires me is Lauren and how mm -hmm. he lives as an artist we've talked about this a lot like not like and live to dedicate myself to the cello. Like he does that too. But like the, the part that I'm talking about is like living your life, knowing that you're creating it as you're going. Um, and knowing that like like the songwriting thing, like he didn't do that before he moved here. Like, and he's like, I'm gonna do it. So he practices it and tries it and experiments with it and like does it, lives, yeah. lives artistically mm -hmm. like you're living your life as a as a as art there there is creation there is exploration there's experiments there's there is not a this has to look like this or sound like this it's just all like let there's curiosity mm -hmm. yes as, and not <laughs> uh, yeah i don't i tend to just always explore new things and, mm -hmm. and not get stuck. like I think some artists be like oh I'm good at this and like this is what I'm going to do and I just do this and you have to right? get that because you trapped in doing that one thing mm -hmm. because you're good at it and if you don't if you're not as good at the other thing you're trying then everyone, you, you won't like reach that level so there's a lot of people who just never try anything new for that reason and there's value in that right like you have, you have artistry and like you're, you're that's your artistry and that's what you do but the kind of artistry that I'm more interested in is the curiosity, the like experimentation, mm -hmm. the like living your life as an artist, like creating, because that's what we do as humans, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's what we do as humans. And then it relates to me to the emotional thing and the like that, and it relates to my projects too. Like at certain, at my thesis, I told you earlier that I was very pregnant baby. So my thesis, was a trio with Eleanor, who was eight months old, and Lauren. And it was in the house that we were renting at my graduate program, which is the, it was no longer exists, Collins, Collins University and American Dance Festival combined. So it was at the American Dance Festival, which is like a summer, big summer program for students. Um, but they had to cross, cross campus and go into our house. And sometimes she would be sleeping and sometimes she would be, you know, like, she would be cueing us because she would grab the bag of toys and make noise. So like, it was just, it was really a, a moment for me in my thesis of like, oh, art, life is art, art is life, um, which I kind of already was exploring, mm -hmm. but it was really clear that like having a baby, there's no way that I can't and not that I can't not include her. But, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, and that's what I love. I, okay. So I love that about you guys because um so many of the the spaces that you go into she's there I remember the last one of the last events that um you hosted it was I can't remember the gal's name um but she had this whole she had put together this whole like wild like internet thing oh that, Michelle Ellsworth that she yeah, yeah this who is Aunt Ellsworth's sister who Anne Ellsworth teaches Lauren at Lawrence and yeah. she's anyway yeah. yeah that was all about like 
It was about everything. It was about everything. I was like, like, yeah. I <laughs> there was a part of me that was like, is she okay? <laughs> It was so mm. complex, but kind of try, trying to speak about it at a high level, it was like about social media experience and about connection and disconnection and isolation. Greek mythology. And, and Greek mythology. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so many things. But I remember before that performance, Eleanor was going around like giving everybody stickers to put on their foreheads or something. Mm-hmm. And I'm just like, this is amazing. Like, <laughs> you guys have been so great at like including her in those spaces where I feel mm-hmm. like sometimes that's not always, you don't, you don't see that, right? Like it's, it's the kids are over here at the, I remember growing up and there was always a kid's table and I hated that. I was always like, I want it to be at the same table as everyone else. You know, mm-hmm. I don't want to be stuck here at the kids' table just because I'm a kid, right? Like, yeah. She she taught us a lot. Like, I was talking about my thesis. We had a structure. It was improvised, but there was definitely a structure. And it was this amazing house where there was a living room. But then there was like a little dining room and then there was like a little study and then there was the kitchen, the kitchen and then the back door. So like it was this long view that the mm-hmm. people sat in, in this room and then there were hallways off to the bedroom. And Lauren had set up a baby monitor so you could hear hers because sometimes she'd be sleeping in the beginning. You could hear like the cars and stuff. And then he also was picking up the audience as they come in and then I would start dancing. He would go get her at some point in the baby bjorn and like bring her out, bouncing with her little legs like that, and then would put her on me. It came up with, we came up with this kind of structure of one of us will be taking care of her and the other one will be being more creative in the moment Mm -hmm. from a, from an experience we had when we went to see a, a music show of our friend Nate Stanley, Nathaniel Stanley was singing, and it was in you know space where they they weren't allowing babies. So one of us would sit with the baby outside in the lobby, and the other one would go like hear a couple songs, and then we'd switch, yeah. and the other one would got to hear a song, and then the other with Eleanor. And so that was kind of the framework of my thesis. And at some point. He would put her on me and then start playing more cello music and I would do what I could underneath her and then when he would stop playing at some point the next part was um there were these baby toys that made sounds that we had in a bag but then she would be playing with those well we would do some other um like architectural space stuff in the room and at one point, like she reached for the bag to like cue us, you know, like she's like, we're done with the section, we're moving on. Like that was <laughs> when she was like eight months old, right? Like, well, and even the thing of like, there was a beautiful section that I had where like she would be in the wrap, like nursing while I was moving. Mm-hmm. But that got axed because by the time that she was, the time we were performing it in front of people, she was no longer interested in, in like, if there was anybody around, she'd be like, Right. Like, so she wouldn't stay in the wrap anymore. Mm-hmm. So, like, really listening to what she had to tell us was our first, like, that would be in that first thing. Well, even before that, I did a piece when I was pregnant, and it was just for my, in my grad school. And it, uh, there was a projection on my belly, and Lauren, I had a recording of Lauren playing a song that he played all the time. And what was the song? I don't remember the name of it, but it was. No, it's I wrote the song. it for. No, 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 it's not that song. No. It's the. That song. You know, but that chalk bellow, the Bach cello. Oh, oh. Suites. Bah, 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 bah. sorry. Ah. Bach cello suite, right? Is that it? Sweet number something. It's really hard to sing. <laughs> yeah, it is. I <laughs> know. Okay, okay. Yeah, I. Mm-hmm. That. Yeah. yeah, I'm a chuck. <laughs> 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 
but that song would play and she would start moving because he always played that song for her. And so like I had people's hands on my belly and it was just a media class for my grad school. So it was just for my grad cohort, but their hands were on my belly. The song would start playing and she would start dancing inside. Mm -hmm. Like, so early on, she was telling me things like how, and then that thesis got trans, like I'd write my thesis paper with that. And um, we were supposed to, you know, put a end of the paper and like what was missing, what would you do next? And I was like, community, that was the, that was the thing that was missing. And one of the reasons I chose my, my MFA program is because there were such a range of people in the program and, um, and a lot of mothers, a lot of parents. Mm -hmm. And so I asked four other dancer moms and their children to be in peace with us that we did in St. Mark's Church in New York. Um, and it felt like a political statement because th that separation that you're talking about, about kids' tables and about like in New York at any art thing, you don't see kids, right? Like mm -hmm. they're, they don't exist. <laughs> you know, they, um, mm -hmm. And especially in New York, it felt different actually coming to Wisconsin, but like in New York, in art scenes, like there, it felt like a political thing to have kids, to have like there were, I think, 10 kids under the, under the age of four mm -hmm. movies. And, and we were doing, we were using ensemble thinking, which is a lower left technique for group improvisation. And we, and, children have so much to teach us like that right. like there's so yeah. much that um they know how to improvise there was an, another piece we did with um Jung Woon and Marion and their two kids or their kid at the time and and and, and niece um oh, you're right. yeah, yeah. Philadelphia like and there was a write-up about it and the the person was like the kids are the ones who know how to improvise and they do they know how that like there's such there's so much um that we can learn from children and from listening mm -hmm. to each other no matter what our ages are like yeah. to me that's the yeah. like like no matter how old young like how can we listen together mm -hmm. and create together mm -hmm. um i love that yeah i wrote a song for that Which for the thesis which one? Eleanor, oh. on the day, what did you do today? Did you have a good time? Did you have fun? <laughs> yeah. You wrote a lot of songs. You also uh, wrote Super Baby. Uh, yeah, I wrote a lot of silly songs, <laughs> but I, I got more serious about songwriting here. But that's true. Yeah. But it was like there was always they would just dribble in, but I wouldn't record them or perform them much. I mean, for this thesis thing, we did. I did it, but. Yeah. It comes natural to kids. Yeah. You think that what yeah. you're describing there, it's, it's they're creating their lives all the time. Yeah. They're playing super like intensely and then dropping it on a dime, right? Yeah. They um they they know how to line up, like they see something and they know how to join. They also know how to when they like want to be a soloist and like mm -hmm. they're yeah. At some point along the way. Adults forget about it. Teenagers forget about it, or the, the it's drilled out of us. Yeah, yeah, like it gets trained and educated mm -hmm. out of us. Mm -hmm. Not only the like body stuff, like Alexander technique of like of like how we use our bodies, right? Like when you when you're when before school, we don't sit in a chair all the time and look up at the teacher all the time and facing the you know like there's so much that gets mm -hmm. like trained out of us of like so much of education is about training us to follow rules mm -hmm. not necessarily to be creative or to yeah or to be collaborating or to like know mm -hmm. how to collaborate or to know how to yeah my dad has the cliche statement we need to learn how to put the play back into playing music mm -hmm. <laughs> we're all as adults trying to find that that inner child right mm -hmm. so if you actually do it, it's kind of fun. <laughs> <laughs> but 
the you form is all we're playing with, whatever. right? Like the formlessness, that's so that's like the fact that like the form stuff, the like dancing, the music, the like, I don't know, whatever it is that you're doing, you're not playing with it. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned ensemble thinking mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in that. Can you describe kind of what that is and how you facilitate it? Yeah, ensemble thinking was kind of it was a long story that I won't was founded by Nina Martin, who is part of the collective Lower Left that I'm a part of. Um, Lower Left has really developed it um, together as a collective. It is a collective, but we work really collective in every way, administratively, artistically. It's, I, some people talk about collaboration and they mean like, I do my part, you do your part, and you do your part, and then we come together and put it together. But this is true, like on all levels, collaboration. Um, but that's the lower left, the collective part of ensemble thinking is a system of scores, um, scores like music scores or, mm -hmm. or dance or, or, or movement scores. but. Um, or facilitating individual and collective action is like the simple way to say it. Um, Should we do one for the camera? Ooh. You gotta what just, would we you do? Gotta, <laughs> we could do a number of sports. You gotta just what you're doing. That would take some movement. That would be hard. And, <laughs> and it's also it's also a podcast. So. We can move. <laughs> we can move things. There's Those are the uh, so moment, And we can describe like what you're doing, or you can describe what you're doing as you're doing it for the people that are only listening. I'm gonna try to talk because it's something that I'm that I'm working on actually is articulating things more verbally because I'm so like uh, I'd rather be in my body and less in my in the top down and more in the bottom up mm -hmm. thinking. Um, but it's it's a set of scores that help give you both communication, gives you vocabulary for, for creating together. Um, and also it's like almost like simple drawing, like drawing 101, but for collaborative movement. Mm. And so it illuminates power a lot. And I've been trying to I'm trying. I've been realizing that it's a amazing lens for thinking about anti-racism, and it's also it to me. There's so many applications. I love it. Um, but the core, the actual practicalness of it is physical scores that we do in the room together as a group, and we also do a lot of watching and talking about it as we're doing it. You asked how to facilitate it. Mm -hmm. That's actually, I love that because that's something that I've been pushing where we've, we've been working on a teacher training for ensemble thinking for a long time now, years. Um, and one thing I really feel strongly about is that it should be taught collectively, collaboratively with more than one person. And the way I do that, if I'm the only teacher, because I do teach that at Lawrence and Paul, is you really have to keep being aware of and giving the power to the room, mm -hmm. um, to mm -hmm. everybody in the room. And that's part of what ensemble thinking does. Like it, it works on, on all the levels, right? Like on the, um, the micro level and also in like the room and the movement level. Um, but it really is about making visible power, I feel like sometimes as part of what it is. I think it would be amazing. Like uh, one of my colleagues has worked with like a startup in Texas that she lives in Texas and they did it both to like boost creativity, but also to like how to work better together and yeah. how to communicate better together. Yeah. Um, yeah, the classic corporate team building exercise. Right? It could be used for that completely. And I think it's, yeah, it's hard hard to explain without, you know, doing 20 hours of ensemble thinking together, but. Um, Would you say it builds awareness? Definitely. Of a room? It, I mean, for me, I sometimes don't necessarily, I wouldn't call it power, but more noticing the decisions in the room. 
and how it affects the whole, mm -hmm. which could be seen as power, but it's also just like if just doesn't move, then I'll play this, which would cause you to do a move, and then then maybe you start singing and there's all these interrelationships and decisions that happen and more it's just like noticing and being very conscious of, of what that is and if i make a decision these changes happen because of me and then i also need to be aware of other, other people doing and not just like you know, what too far i'm making all decisions or just waiting for everyone else to make decisions kind of kind of come to some some kind of sim, symbiotic relation symbiotic relationship i mean of course power is a part of that but um, I think I've been thinking about power in in relationship to the anti-racism lens mm -hmm. and like how you have to yeah be aware and be listening and to know where you stand in the room even of power differential. Uh, there's also one specific score um, called giving focus and taking focus, giving and taking focus. So we separate it first and then we do it together. But that to me is completely about power and about but it's yeah you can see it as power or you can see about leading or following um listening being aware of room being aware you're always in a composition whether you know it or not mm -hmm. and so might as well like why not be aware of where you are and like how to play with that you know there's all kinds of possibilities i mean there's there's power doesn't have to be the bad thing i guess yeah right mm -hmm. so, yeah mm -hmm. and there's always a power there's always power dynamics in a room right mm -hmm. Even like how we're sitting between the two of you, and then, you know, like the king and queen. <laughs> come here. Looks <laughs> well, well, the lecture has come. But should we sit on the couch? Can you guys sit on the chairs? You can sit on the chair. How would change? Things? Well, you I could use, I could use a race actually. It's a facial like, arrangement yeah. makes a difference. We'll jump back in with. Um, Kind of your thought on projects that are bringing you energy, current projects, things you're working on, things that you're collaborating on. I'd love to hear what some of those are and who you're working with. You want to go first? Well, I think it'd be fun to talk about stuff that's happening locally in the community. Yeah. Um, you know, kind of. We've talked about 602 a couple of times. So there's the 602 Club on Lost Street, 602 Lost Street. It's kind of artistic <laughs> nexus and center of a lot of what happens around Appleton. Um, and there's some collaborators that I, I, I get a lot of energy from. Um, the first is, is Tad and Joanna, uh, Tad Newhouse and Joanna Dane. And, you know, we, we if you don't know them, Tad, you know, does a lot of improv improvisation with music, and Joanna is does all sorts of different things: poetry, singing, art. Um, but we've been jamming basically once a week. You know, you not every last week, but you know, jamming regularly just for ourselves ever since I moved here, and it's a kind of jamming where I'll we'll play instruments that I'm Experiment. very un unfamiliar with mm -hmm. and wouldn't actually want to improvise in front of an audience because I don't feel super competent on the drum set, you know, mm -hmm. but it's kind of fun just to like, you know, learn the basics and have a place to improvise in a, in a very safe exploratory space on instruments mm -hmm. and, and that are kind of new. So it feels very, very fun, experimental. And we'll improvise songs together. I'll, you know, just kind of, lyrics will pop out of any one of us and so that's like it's, it's just a practice we rarely perform but we don't really put our that stress on, on ourselves um and actually joanna wrote an article about it in, in fabricating something more recently um just which was kind of cool fabricating something more is called fsm, FSM oh, yeah. which is okay. a, yeah. the good old art the yeah, the arts journal mm -hmm. local arts journal and um and then also because you know through that through Tad and Joanna, we also I also met Len Baruso, who's this you know awesome local filmmaker, makes all sorts of amazing uh, films with people in the neighborhood using local actors. Uh, you know I know you know you, you are featured in first person, mm -hmm. and, and so it's you know we all know know and love Len, but Margaret and I have worked with Len and the flash mob a trois series <laughs> this is what it calls it and there's this little spot on law street 
just a couple of blocks north of the 602 club where there's this weird jagged uh, roof on a building and Len had always thought it was this very attractive spot. So he, he's had us come now four times. And started during COVID too. Started during COVID. And uh, in a day, it was like zero degrees in, in January. Zero degrees, February. it was January, I think. And he was said, you know, there's that spot. He'd already talked to us about that spot. I think yeah. like, let's meet there and we'll make something. And so like we talked on the phone. That was pretty much what we said, maybe even just text. And then Lauren and I drove up. Len had already or was setting up his tripod and his camera across the street. We put a chair down for Lauren <laughs> and then improvised with what was there in zero degree weather yeah. for like five minutes, something like that. Yeah, I recorded into a little Zoom recorder. And it was like one take done. We'd left, we like waved. We didn't even like. Yeah, at that time we're like, we talked to him, we're gonna die. <laughs> <laughs> it was like it was super like extreme. Oh, okay. it, and yeah. then like we just did it. And then got in the car, like we started at one side of the street, improvised, got in the car, he left, and then he made it into a film. And since then we've like been doing iterations of it in different mm -hmm. seasons. Yeah. Um, the tree grows every time. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's cool. This tree. Mm -hmm. And yeah. yeah. Once with some students that like did mobbed through once the road was closed and we did it. So what were you gonna say? Well, yeah, I know it, it what was cool is Len put it in for one of those community art trout exhibitions. So he was showing up the trout for a second, which is cool. Mm -hmm. And it feels very like Wisconsin to have your fingers get frostbite. Like they started <laughs> to actually get hard. <laughs> and I was also playing a barbed wire cello, which is another thing that kind of inspires me recently. Um, That's what I was going to talk about. Actually, yeah. is Dahlia. So we're also part of a trio um, with my friend Dahlia Nair, who I met through grad school and was in that piece with, with kids. mothers yeah. who and kids and um so we collaborated like that and but we started working as a trio at some point and um, we're now the uh-oh trio that's the name our name is uh-oh trio mm -hmm. and to me it's not necessarily a um like they know I'm allergic. That's why they come. They know I'm allergic. They're just starting. <laughs> like it, it's it's usually fine, but um, not necessarily even like a project per se, but it's like a collaboration that's mm -hmm. inspiring to me. That continues to be inspiring to me is that trio. Mm -hmm. um, it's Dahlia's amazing um, human being that I would go anywhere for. Um, and and is also interesting because it brings out different things in our trio relationship mm -hmm. than I would ever bring out just like Lauren and I playing together or you know um, for sure yeah and so one of the things we did a long time ago now maybe 2013 or something we did we made a piece actually it was the first piece that I ever left Eleanor for overnight. Um, we made a piece called Stan, uh, 2125 Stanley Street. And then we did a West Coast tour where we where we flew to Southern California with our daughters. She only had a daughter at the time and we had a daughter. She now has another, she has a son um, too. But so it was the three of us, a three-year-old and a six-year-old and a cello and laundry baskets and socks because that was part of the thing and like our whole set in my parents' minivan, we like performed at the Hammer Museum in LA, and then we went to the, the Buddhist temple that my grandfather uh, ran and, um, in, San Francisco. in San Francisco. I also stayed in this Buddhist temple when I got my master's degree in San Francisco and lived there as a, as a caretaker, just doing whatever the, you know, the people needed there, so we performed at the Buddhist Temple. But we're, and then we went to yeah. Portland, and we like we were in Portland less than twenty four hours, and we performed in a space. We went to Austin, is like yeah. What's the name of it? South, Northwest, something. I forget the name of it. Anyway, and then we went to Seattle. Like we did this whole huge trip. Went to Seattle, 
and performed at the chapel in Seattle. And then um, my trio met us in San Francisco, I think. Right? Oh, somewhere. Yeah. So I had a string trio. Trio Tritakeli. And then yeah. Lauren flew back to New York from Seattle. My parents flew up to Seattle. Dahlia and Ruthie went north to Vancouver to meet her parents where they were doing something. And then Eleanor, my parents, and I drove back down their minivan back town to Southern California. Like that was like an epic trip that was like kind of combined everything that I don't know that I'm about. Mm -hmm. And um, and we continue to work with her. And one of the it's been prolonged and we're stressed she's now getting her PhD. So we're we have had less. And whatever all the reasons we've had less contact, but we're still working together. And one of the things that we've started working on but haven't finished that to me is still exciting is well, I mean, we as the as a part of our research together, we explore the kind of similarities and connections or intersections of um of our family histories. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one of the, one of the things we've explored is the, the Japanese side of my heritage. Um, mm -hmm. And so the, with this idea of the internment, um, you know, how do we make some art if we think about the Japanese internment during World War II? So we actually did a pilgrimage to Topaz, Utah, where my family was was imprisoned for two years. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I, I wrote a lot of a few songs, kind of exploring that, um, uh, like Suna Arashi, yeah. like one of our great yeah. hits uh, from the band. Um, but you know, some other songs came out. Of it. One of the experiments I did was to string up a a piece of barbed wire as a C string to kind of represent sort of being behind barbed wire in the middle of this mountain desert. In the middle, of, you know, it's yeah, actually nowhere. nowhere, but it was really beautiful there. I mean, it was really gorgeous. But if you have to be there and like, you yeah, know, move there from living in your whole life in San Francisco, yeah, mm -hmm. like near the coast, you, you have this, it's hard to have your own culture. So it's crazy there. It's so, yeah, but so that was a kind of research, researching family history and just to see what what would we do with that again, experimenting. So part of that is, is this bar bar cello, but the Barbar cello has taken many forms. It's like had this other life. Not mean playing with the land, but it's pretty punk rock to have a piece of barbed wire <laughs> on, on the cello. So I've written like I'll put distortion on it, and just like oh, no, 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 no. You know, like all right, this is like to be death metal. <laughs> and then you know, recently I played it at this art gallery opening, just you know, the Limola Arts Gallery. And because the cello, I found this cello in the trash, and like I used spare parts in Brooklyn. Oh, wow. Yeah, and that's like had an extra bridge and an extra end pin and saw like these spare parts and just kind of got it back up and running. And so this is the cello that I put the piece of barbed wire on because I'm not going to put it on like a nice cello, but you know it's a reused, recycled cello, and and the theme of the the gallery was you know ecological resilience and this kind of thing. So it seemed like like a good fit. So it just and then I played it on Halloween night with actually tad and joanna mm, and so we played on and and yeah so tad and jo like on joanna's porch you know and so we're freaking out these kids i'm playing a cello with a piece of barbed wire and I'm playing these kind of you know scrapey sounds and like people are like we're freaking people out and then the the uh mark Ernest, who's a the bass professor at lawrence joined us with a giant you know he's tall and he had, he had put on a mask and he was playing violin you know he's a bass player but he's playing violin and he would like just kind of like stand up, you know, at a hedge and the kids would get the scare. And I'm like, you know, and Joanna, I don't know if you've seen Joanna on Halloween. It's really something you just experience if you haven't. <laughs> uh, but, you know, she like really embodies this kind of, you know, ghostly. Her hair is all out. Like, yeah, like just, and, just, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Some yeah. kind of sorceress. Uh, powerful mage, I don't know, but probably undead, you know, just something's going on there. And, sh and she'll play cello as well. And it's just, you know, in a very scrapey kind of way. I don't know. 
So there's a lot of cool local things happening. Mm -hmm. And then, and, well, I was going to say that, yeah, we've been still working with Dahlia, and we also worked with her cousin, who's a visual artist by oh, yeah. Bruce Paeo, and awesome. um, went to, to Salt Lake City and, and did something in a gallery there recently. Yeah, this was the, are we out of the pandemic yet? Mm -hmm. Like that exploration. Last year. So I, I sent a track both times, but you went and danced live. And and I was on the plane, but yeah, that's another story. We um, yeah. I want to say something else. Oh, and Set Go and Laura Left is going to come this summer. That's actually really exciting to me. That, what is it? So Lower Left, the collective I'm in front of, yeah. a few of us, because it's eight people across the world right now uh, in Lower Left, but Lower it's Left set, and Set Go, set go. which okay. is a collective that's come to um, Lawrence before 2000, right before the pandemic, actually. They okay. were here in January. Um, Brando, Bradley Teal Ellis, Paul Singh, Sarah Connor, and Shura Burishnikov, who's Burishnikov's daughter. Um, they're part of this collective that um, they are amazing improvisers, contact improvisers, but also compositional group improvisers. improvisers. And together, we're going to do a workshop at Lawrence mm. in the summer. Sign up. <laughs> dance. For dancers, for contact improvisers and I'm gonna ensemble keep, thinkers. I'm going to keep an eye on. Yeah, in yeah. July. In July. Okay. Yeah. And then also Tatiana Tenenbaum. Like, so I bring people here through Lawrence, which is amazing. That's an amazing benefit, mm -hmm. being able to bring these artists. Most of my friends, because it's a small, small budget, but so part of the benefit is getting to be together. But um, Tatiana Tenenbaum is also coming in April. April 6th. Anyway, there's so there's so much. Yeah. How do you decide what projects to take up? Mm. Mm. Someone says, hey Lauren, you want to do this? <laughs> yeah, it doesn't take me more. Well. Like, yeah. <laughs> Let's give it a shot. Right. Try to make your location mindset and talk about I don't know. Did I say no to anything recent ever? <laughs> you said no to teaching something in Oshkosh or something like that. I yeah, I, I said no to going to Stevens Point to teach because we only had one car, okay. and it seemed like at that time. And if I was to go and do that, then Margaret would be out without the car with the five year old. That just didn't seem like an intelligent choice. <laughs> um, you know, maybe maybe I would do that now, but now I seem to have enough going on here. Um, Margaret, you talked about the people. I was just going to say that yeah. I think that it's really relational for me how I decide, like, like Dahlia, she's my sister, I, we, we call her her sister wife, but she, I would, I would go anywhere for Dahlia. Um, lower left has transformed over the years, but, you know, some people I've known for 30 years now, I think. And so it's a balance between like these deep relationships and also saying yes to things when when they're unknown. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when they're they spark anything in me. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, that sounds exciting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No. Is there anything else? Do you have any other questions? Do you guys have anything else that you are burning to? tell the right now i think we're at 18 subscribers on youtube oh, so it's amazing <laughs> it might be a 19 related although i might have tried to subscribe I think yeah well you know, it's related to either um even or his partner <laughs> oh, my signature. i'll make you dinner if you subscribe come in <laughs> Yeah, Mike, Mike has subscribed. Yeah. My husband has subscribed. <laughs> I should subscribe. <laughs> no, people are watching. Yeah. People are watching and appreciate yeah. it. But, but yeah, but, well, it doesn't matter, right? One person. Well, I think that's that's kind of what we're playing with. Yeah. Because who are we doing it for? Right. What is that like? And we talked about yeah. guest yeah. experience, and, right? Yeah. This evening, the social, talk together. The social yeah. connection that is yeah. this evening. Yeah. 
Yeah, nobody really wants mm -hmm. to talk to me unless they're going to be made famous by it. So. You never know. That's true. I, <laughs> I think about I, every single guest that um, I've asked on here, I think about all the time. Mm -hmm. um, I just, you know, obviously our lives are full. There's always something going on. Um, but I'm always thinking of you guys. Mm -hmm. and, um, I still have collaborative ideas in my head that I want to do with you all. So keep an eye out for <laughs> messages coming your way. <laughs> I thought of uh, one thing to say too is the March March fifth open jam. That's another thing project that's in place. It's Ooh, just like okay, yeah, it's open space that Lawrence for for improvising together, whether it's music or movement. Well, you know, they're both the same thing in my eyes, but yeah, whether you consider yourself a musician or a dancer or both or, right. or, neither. Open or neither. Yeah. Yeah. The Appleton yes. dance community. It's in the dance space, large space. I think it's 12 30 or anyway. Um yeah, I think that's the usual time that it's at. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, I'll get a either way, we'll put a we'll throw a link in there because your your episode will come out on the second weekend of February, we had Kate and Rob we talked to before, so they're going to be the first week. And I thought of Kate because she was the first person. Is that that band people? Yeah, yeah I think I met before them. Dawn. Um, yeah, yeah, so I uh, Kate was, yeah. yeah, yeah, and they were they were part of um, Len's project too. Mm -hmm. um, first person, yeah. Um, but I thought of Kate because she was the first person to actually come with me to one of the mm -hmm. movement things, right? Like usually mm -hmm. it would just it would just be me going and playing mm -hmm. and exploring the space. And so that was nice to have somebody else there that that yeah. joined me and enjoy the space and the movement. I guess and the one other thing that I would say that that we've a little bit touched on but that came up in just reading your questions mm -hmm. was was living in liminal space like mm. there was something about upbringing and values and race that i was like i did oh, yeah. yeah yeah but it feels like as a mixed race person and i've always felt in between yeah. worlds yeah. and as a middle child i've always felt in between worlds mm. and mm. or like in the middle right mm. and also as um in many ways i felt in kind of the in between and what we were just talking about about unknown and like what the unknown how I feel like the the places between things the liminal spaces the space of unknown is all, is is a place to move into mm -hmm. or through or with or play with mm -hmm. um, that to get curious about rather than yeah uh, that I think is fertile for creativity and, yeah. and artistry and practice. Yeah. We'll try not to quote the, the into the unknown. <laughs> Frozen? <Yeah. laughs> but I did. <laughs> Sorry, but and that's what we'll end. Yeah. 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 Yeah.